Good day everyone, my name is Ola and this is the Real Happy Hour podcast. This is a very special episode this time around. Usually I'm in the studio but this time around we're doing it via Zoom and as um, I guess as you can see as um, obviously drank a glass of of, of, of cocktail or something there um, the real happy hour basically is we talk about the relational dynamics of films and TVs and we usually have some sort of drink or snacks that sort of connotes the emotion of having fun as you're drinking and you're chilling with your friends and you're having a conversation this is basically meant to feel like you're having a conversation with your friend but we're talking about films and we're talking about TV and the dynamics of the characters and the movies and the TV shows so my guest today is Mr. Emmanuel Anyamosigwe. He is a prominent filmmaker, producer, and broadcaster. He spent his early career coordinating festivals to eventually creating a self-funded festival called the British Urban Film Festival in 2005, which provided a showcase to creatives. The film festival was added to the Section B list of qualifying film festivals by BAFTA for British short films. Mr. Emmanuel later co-founded Buff Originals. In February 2018, this was launched to act as a production and distribution arm of the British Urban Film Festival. Thank you very much, Mr. Emmanuel, for coming on the show. Um, can we just Thanks start? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, very glad to have you. Let's start from the beginning. Um, just researching you, I feel like in a lot of ways, the Black Film filmmaker magazine international film festival sort of foretold the law of what you're doing now in terms of festivals so can you tell us about your journey in, in that aspect of you know getting into that into the into that organization and how that's influenced where you are now well thanks for the briefing before the recording started because we'll do well to cram everything into 40 minutes so i'll try and keep my answers brief and make sure you get as much out of it and all your listeners get as much out of it as I do in sharing my journey with you, which has kind of come full circle. But let's go back to the beginning of the BFM Black Filmmaker magazine, which was founded in the late 1990s by a gentleman called Menlik Shabazz, who, for those that study film and Black British film and the history of British film, full stop, is known as the godfather of black British cinema, um, having put together his own feature film in 1981 called Burning an Illusion. It's one of the first depictions of black love on screen. And obviously today in the age of Netflix and streamers, black love films at 10 a penny, almost, um, we're still kind of looking for more stories um, to kind of celebrate the black experience. but. I'm going off on a tangent there. But essentially, the reason why Menelik um, set up the magazine was that having returned from the Cannes International Film Festival in, I believe, 1997, um, he realised coming back to the UK that there was no outlet that was reporting on Black World Cinema <clears throat> in the UK. Obviously, this is before social media. So in those days, the outlet we would be referring to would be a newspaper or a magazine, let alone a TV channel or a TV programme, of which in 2023, we don't even have that as black people, our own kind of film TV show. But I can't solve every problem. But anyway, I digress again. <laughs> um, Menlik solved the problem himself in uh, 1998 and formed Black Filmmaker magazine to make sure that there was that hub and that resource where black world cinema could be documented and reported um, from the UK. And so I remember at the time I was a student and also a member of the National Film Theatre, which is now known as BFI Southbank. So that kind of shows my age. So I was a member there and in their library, they had the magazine stocked uh, in the shelf. So I was just naturally curious to see this magazine uh, in a film venue that was reporting on black films. So I read it and I fell in love with it straight away. And me being me and my paranoia and kind of insatiable appetite for all things that I'm really passionate about, I went to the festival as I as with my magazine, I realized that they also had a film festival. So I went along to their annual film festivals, which took place every September in London. And then on one such occasion, I think it was 2001, 
Um, because I've still got the t-shirt. Um, wow. In the company. Um, I should have worn that today, but anyway, um, I might bring it out later. So after that festival, I went up to Menlik and just told him I'd love to work for you. Um, and so a year later, in my summer holidays, um, it became my summer job working at Black Horse Lane. Um, and I was there for two years, arguably, obviously, the best two years of my professional life because it was that foundation which then became the basis for my later work with Screen Nation, for which I spent a year with Charles Thompson, MBE. And then 2005, I set up my own film festival, Buff, whilst studying my degree at Thames Valley University in Ealing. Wow, so you set up while you were studying. How was that experience like? Because you're juggling two things. It's not easy being a student. And then you've created an organisation. against. Like, that's a lot to juggle. How were you able to? Sure. Well, it was almost accidental, kind of creating the film festival whilst I was a student. Because originally, having got the job at Black, film, uh, Black Filmmaker Magazine, I was intent on succeeding Menlik. So I was almost trying to instigate the succession plan because Melikin is first and foremost a filmmaker. So obviously setting up the magazine and the film festival, obviously he put a team together, which included Charles Thompson, as I've mentioned, and many other people that are still in the industry today. So we were all there at the time. But Melik is first and foremost a filmmaker. So in the quieter times, we would have discussions about how he saw the film festival in the future, and how I saw my kind of place in it. And I very much thought that I would be the successor to him at the festival. So obviously there was that kind of inner desire to run something like a film festival through BFM. But when that didn't happen, um, just through various circumstances, I then moved on to Screen Nation, worked for a year with Charles, uh, who was kind of creating a Black BAFTAs. That's basically what Screen Nation is, celebrating black talent through its own award system, not just in the UK, but globally as well. So when I worked with Charles, I was kind of tasked with developing and championing Nollywood and West African cinema, which is what I did for a full year. I developed a TV show and produced a TV show as part of the awards build-up. So that was kind of what happened in 2004. And then 2005, whilst studying for my degree at uh, Thames Valley University, um, I was setting up my first production company called IQ Creations with one of my oldest friends, who's very much kind of a household name in Nigeria. He um, developed the formats for Dragon's Den, Big Brother, Love Island. So those Nigerian versions of those shows, my friend was responsible for making sure that the Nigerian audiences got their own versions of that. So we were very much part of a kind of generation of diasporans that were kind of making waves in the industry. Um, and so myself and my good friend, uh, we set up a company, our first company in 2001. This was three years into our degree. Um, and the reason why we set up the company was because in our very first week as students, we were told by the vi vice chancellor that our degrees would not amount to much. Wow. We already had this motivation to kind of prove him wow. wrong. And obviously being the son of Nigerian parents, that's the last thing we want to kind of talk to them about, failure. Why do you think he said that? Sorry? Why do you think he said that? Well, what happened at the time was there was, they have this annual Sunday Times list of top 100 universities. And the university at the time was in the bottom 10. And so I had just obviously started my degree. So to be told this in our first week was like, well, what are we supposed to do here? For what, find another university or yeah, it's, 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 degree, it's, knowing that it's not going to amount to much? I mean, I think it's interesting that you say that because as 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 kids, second generation kids that are outside of Africa and we're studying something in the creative field, we usually get that sort of pushback from our parents. But the way they're saying like, this is not a field where you make a lot of money it's usually out of care but that worries a lot of time is placed where they just worry that where you're pursuing right now wouldn't necessarily give you a, a successful life so to hear your side of this of the story where it's actually someone in the university saying that that is really strange Do you think he said that because you were black or it just didn't matter it was just the university's ranking it's interesting what you said about kind of race because 
throughout my life, when, when I do these interviews and have these types of conversations, and people ask me questions about whether you encounter racial discrimination, fortunately, I've not had to encounter that much, whether literally or kind of um, subtly, in terms of uh, unconscious bias, all these terms that people like to use and throw around. So the fact that he said that, it's not something that I thought at the time was his motivation for saying what he said. But as you pointed out, being the child of Nigerian parents, entering film and TV is not something that they had in mind for their children, um, let alone someone that was born in the UK, because obviously they're already thinking that their children are going to be doctors. Exactly. Um, yeah. And all those kinds of white collar, blue collar jobs. So I was the prodigal son from a very, very early age. Um, but I was so in love with television. I was watching television from the age of four and five, watching films and TV programs that I shouldn't be, just because I loved the colours on the screen and the sounds. And obviously as a child, that's what you're kind of first impressed by. Kind of thinking, what are all these noises coming out of a box mm. that's so big and loud and that's capturing everyone's attention? So as you get older, when you realise that that box, that television has such a profound influence on how you see the world and then you might actually contribute to that in terms of coming up with ideas for shows and tv programs and films which is what i was doing as a young child i was already writing scripts and ideas for shows then in later life when you realize that you could actually study the course in this you're just thinking it's christmas so yeah. when i got the degree it was almost as if that's a bonus because just understanding kind of the degree in what was studied in terms of the theory and the practical elements of video production, journalism, me media studies, psychology, sociology. Once you put all that together, what they don't tell you about is the business side of it, which obviously for black people, you're always up against it already because of your race. But when you're not being told about the business side of it and the economic side of it, I guess setting up a production company as students was just kind of like, a very very bold step but it just I guess spiritually it just meant that we were in control of the narrative in terms of how we want to portray ourselves on screen and off screen in terms of the intellectual property because when we did set up that company in 2001 um, we were faced with a dilemma where it was quite clear that one of the big kind of production companies had stolen our idea mm. and we had a solicitor at the time and we were advised to kind of not take them on because Obviously, we haven't got any skin in the game. We're just students. And yet here we are coming with, with ideas which are suddenly being copied. So when you're thinking, we must be doing something ahead of our time. So obviously, our kind of fortune is almost made. Is that If we can come up with an idea like this as students, imagine what we could do when we're kind of fully, kind of proper, you know, um, follow a uh, proper media production company. So already there was things that were happening in 2001, 2002, 2003. And this is when Big Brother was kind of starting out on television as well. And shows like um, Pop Stars, The Weakest Things. So that was really kind of the birth of reality TV as we knew it then. And obviously now, every channel that you switch on, there's a reality TV show yeah. or Love is Blind or whatever. There's just... But 2000 was kind of the year when it all kind of kicked off. So to then start our production company when all that kicked off. It was almost like we just kind of hit the zeitgeist, hit the jackpot. The fact that we had all our passion and all of our upbringing all immersed. It was just the perfect time to just kind of see where the penny would drop in terms of where is this passion going to lead to? So we set up the production company in 2001. And then in 2005, um, I was the acting president of our African Caribbean Society at the university. And the Prince's Trust had their annual music festival in nearby Earl's Court, which is about an hour away from Ealing. So being a West London University, it was a natural thing to then um, get money out of the Students' Union to then take our ACS to the Urban Music Festival. Um, and obviously the Prince's Trust is run by Prince Charles, which is now King Charles. Yep. And so obviously being there in person, witnessing this music festival and event organized by a white man, said to my friend at the time, if a white man can do this and mobilize 16,000 black people in a room, why can't we as black people do the same? So that kind of eureka moment 
in terms of an urban music festival, we then just turned that into an urban film festival and put a B at the end to then make it buff, which is how the urban film festival was conceived. So environment is such a key in all these things, just being at the right place at the right time and kind of utilising all of the skill sets that you have. Because you, you can't amass all of the skill sets at one time. You kind of build it over time with experience and environment and kind of what you're open to and exposed to. So the fact that I was able to take advantage of all these environments, was, which is what led to... Uh, Creation Buff, of Buff in 2005. Nice, nice. Yeah. So when you created Buff, um, what were the challenges? Because in 2005... You know, there's this theory of new Nollywood and old Hollywood. And I know Buff is not just centered on Nollywood, but like, how, what were the challenges in terms of getting content? Um, again, I go back to environment because having started at Black Filmmaking Magazine, I was really exposed to Black Film because that's all the magazine was about, Black Film. So to those that said at the time that there was kind of no Black Film around, um, it was a lie, clearly, because I was working at companies where that's all they focused on. So obviously when I set up Buff, I kind of knew where all the jewels were in terms of where could I go to get black film, but also to put the message out that here was a platform in Buff where we were a safe space and a showcase for black film. Um, whether people believe me or not, I guess the proof um, remains in the pudding because here we are 18 years later, and the whole world is now playing catch up in terms of um, depicting black film on screen and off screen. Obviously we've had Oscars so white, we've had George Floyd in terms of these moments in culture and history and society where for some reason the mainstream and the status quo are only energized to kind of show empathy to the black experience oh. through adversity when that shouldn't really be the case. So um, can you say that you've definitely seen a shift in the way stories are be black stories are being told from 2005 to now? Absolutely, and in, in many ways, Nigeria as a country has always been a place of uh, kind of go-getters. We're not kind of waiting for permission to get films made, financed, told. Nigeria's always had that built in um, from the early years of Nollywood before I was even born. So the fact that that was kind of the, my calling in terms of what I chose to do as a career, it wasn't really too much of a worry to my parents. A lot of my parents were exposed to Nollywood as well. But I guess being in the UK, there was kind of that fear of, well, before Buff, there was only BFM. And before BFM, there wasn't really anything to celebrate UK black film. So how on earth were you... Were you going to be the person to put yourself out there to test whether this could, thing could work? So I was up against it in terms of my family. And then obviously you've got the industry that is saying to everybody that there's no such thing as black film or black film is not commercial. It doesn't travel. So there was a lot of kind of people I had to prove wrong, including my family. So um, I think what's the one, one thing I'm even noticing is that you, were, you started it so young, like you were in like your early 30s or late 20s yes. and I, i'm i'm sure you must have dealt with ageism like even outside of nigeria just in the industry here people just not taking you seriously like that must have been quite a hurdle to to prove that you know i've got a mission and it's really it's really yeah. interesting because even think, now a lot yeah. of the time with like when i go to like event networking events we're finding that which is exactly which is what I had to do. I had to find something that I felt I was good at and I had to create something where, okay, it's difficult to get something anywhere else. Instead of just waiting to get something, create an avenue where you can be of service to others and that way we can sort of build into something. And I think that's what you've done with, with Buff. Like, obviously you were with other festivals and other organizations and you just saw, okay, there's an opening here for a black urban market and, you know, we need to be seen and you just took it up so it's really remarkable and i just wanted to just point that out no thank you i mean again everything that i'm talking about it just goes back to when i was a child and i always tell people in terms of when people ask me what would be the one thing of advice one piece of advice that you would give people and i would say to always kind of 
search for your inner child in terms of as a child, what was it that was making me happy and passionate? And how do you follow through on that? So everything that I'm doing now goes back to what Emmanuel the child was doing at the age of four, five. And kind of as you get older and you get exposed to other things, how do you absorb and embrace all those experiences and still retain that kind of childlike love and passion for everything that you do? And everything that I've done with Buff stems from that kind of childlike love for the industry, even though to other people, when they see the film and TV industry, they think there's so much oppression and there's so much discrimination. But I'm always looking for the positive because my glass is always half full uh -huh. in spite of what's happening in the industry. So the fact that here we are 18 years on and the industry has now recognised how important it is in terms of representing the black experience on screen and off screen, there are still systemic issues and I can't solve every issue. Obviously, by creating Buff, I have said to everybody, the world, that here is an ecosystem. It's now up to you as to whether you want to be part of that ecosystem. But no one can then say afterwards that there's no black film festival in the UK um, that true. can show my film. Obviously, there are other film festivals, but they all came after Buff. So in very many, in very many ways, we were ahead of the curve. Um, I just because also the theme of this podcast is the relational dynamics. So like, and we touched just before we went on this journey of buff, we touched on the the, the how stories are told from a black perspective. Now, is there is there anything you can say in terms of the differences in the stories then and now? Like, what were the stories that were being told now, and what are the stories being told told then, and what are the stories being told now? Ooh. That's a good question because I've always wanted to be a filmmaker. So growing up, my idol was Steven Spielberg. So at the time, in the 90s and 2000s, a lot of the films that you would watch on television or in the cinema, I didn't really go to cinema until I was much older. It was either a Steven Spielberg film. So it was either Jaws or one of these kind of big films, E.T., that would always come on repeat or it would be a James Bond film. So that's what, kind of what you were exposed to. So in terms of black film, kind of where you would go to, I think in those times it was either a film with Richard Pryor in it or random, any time Michael Jackson released a new song, I don't know whether you recall, but his videos were about nine, ten minutes long. So they were kind of short films in itself. My brother told me about that. I wasn't born then. <laughs> my, brother, my, brother, my brother told me like when Michael Jackson had a music video, it was like a movie premiere. Like everyone would gather around the TV exactly. and sit down to watch. That's right. But I was that's too right. young. <laughs> well, that's God, that. so yes. So yeah, that's kind of what I was exposed to. So also when you're seeing Michael Jackson kind of, again, ahead of his time in terms of how the music video was packaged, promoted, presented, um, remember the time, had an all-black cast on screen and an all-black kind of directing crew behind it. So again, Michael is all about the culture. And so a lot of people have tried to emulate that, not just black artists, such as Beyonce, white artists as well, like Justin Bieber, Justin Timberlake, etc. So in very many ways, black culture was ahead of its time and setting trends, which everyone is now kind of embracing in their art form. But in terms of how stories are told, um, it's an interesting one because in terms of how stories are told, I, I read a book during the pandemic called The Unfair Advantage and it changed my whole kind of perspective on the fact that black people are always up against it in terms of why can't we tell our stories or why are white people telling black stories. Mm. So when I read that book, the one thing that occurred to me was that as black people, we have unfair advantages as well as white people because everyone always talks about white supremacy and white advantage and privilege but black people have it as well it's just that we don't know how to use our advantages and so for me personally full disclosure my family background Anya Mosigwe so my late um, first cousin Peace Anya Mosigwe was the founder of the African Movie Academy Awards which has been going for 18 years and her brother, Charles, um, founded uh, Kumbe Funtime, which is kind of like the Omer Berry of its time, 
in the 1970s and 80s. So well before you were born, probably your parents would probably know Kumbe Fantai. So that's kind of my kind of family stock. That's kind of my heritage. So when you've got family members that are... In the creative field. In the creative field. This must have been easy for you then. You, you, you're doing this. You, you've been telling them I'm studying this. I was like, oh, okay. That's, 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 he's taking the on the family is, legacy. I, I didn't even tell them that I was going to end up in film and TV. It just so happened that I had a natural love of film and TV. So obviously mm. my late dad, who's obviously their direct relative, Obviously, when he's telling them from the UK that his first child is in film and TV, it's almost as if that it was destined that we would all kind of work together and be more closely. But it's never that straightforward because in Nigeria, there are different ecosystems in economics and politics, etc. But obviously, they're watching from afar, kind of seeing their UK relative carve out his own kind of legacy. And in later years, we kind of did kind of work together. Last year, I went to Yamas for the first time with my wife who's also in the film and TV industry, uh, making her own film. Yeah, I was going to um, talk about her because she's really doing some remarkable stuff. Indeed. Yeah. indeed. And, this was, and this was her first choice of industry, but she was kind of known for skincare before she came back to film and television. But um, with Peace, she passed earlier this year, untimely, um, and she was buried a few weeks ago. So, you know, life is very short and tomorrow is one day that everyone thinks they have so that kind of drives kind of my passion with anything that i do not just in film but kind of you know being a father and being a husband to claire so th there's a lot that drives me gives me a reason to wake up in life. so like in terms of your own production like when i was researching i came across um no uh what's it called was No Shade, is that what it's called? No Shade, yeah. which is a black British romantic drama that you produced. And so what has been your experience like in terms of production side of, of, of creating content? So in many ways, making No Shade was kind of exemplifying the ethos of Bar from kind of my MO in terms of, I wasn't waiting for permission from the industry to produce, make a film like No Shade with all of its issues. Because colorism is not an issue that you would say would be the basis for your first film to make. You know, there's so many subjects that you could make. You can make a happy-go-lucky story, a rags and riches story. But to talk about colorism, which is kind of dirty laundry kind of being put out in public in terms of black people discriminating against each other. I think that term colorism that we've not it, solved ourselves you know it's it's i think colorism in, in itself is a language that nigerians we we need to be aware of it because i don't think a lot of us are even aware of the term colorism and so we we just unconscious unconscious possibly unconscious bias of just preferring lighter skinned people to to darker skinned people and not being aware of that and so films like yours which is speaking on colorism is important and that's just the nigerian market and that's it's, it's crazy how outside of africa there's even more of an awareness of colorism compared to like in africa because growing up in nigeria there was never i was there for 18 years there was never any conversation about colorism it's just oh i like that fine person i'll be that fair person so it's all right so there was not even any method behind why they like that person no there was like there was no there was no term for it it was just there everyone just wanted to be fair but there was no there was so what was the conversation like with the dark person was it the same or oh, i like how you look or what was the conversation there was like? always a preference for for a lighter skinned person always always even my experience not even being aware of it like it's just it's, it's it's wild it's really wild but then the older you get the more educated you get the more you you you're more appreciative of of your of your background for yeah so so how how would darker people kind of um what's the word i'm looking for how would they appreciate it or not as the case may be um i don't know but i just i know there was definitely for a female for example that received less attention so in, yes. in that sense they would receive less attention than the fair skin person sure. yeah and yeah, just, it's a huge yeah. issue because when my wife 
who's darker than me, um, when she set up her skincare business, a lot of her clients wanted her to develop skin bleaching creams. Yeah. And for ethical reasons, she chose not to. However, the beauty industry was going in that direction because you had lots of famous music artists developing these skin bleaching creams. And so obviously she just thought, this is not for me. And that became the basis for the story. So she was the most qualified person to tell that story. Plus the fact that she was married to me, she knew that there was that ecosystem in Buff where Buff could show that film, knowing that there'll be no resistance or kind of pushback from the industry. Obviously there was pushback because it was an issue for black audiences in terms of, did they want to watch such a film? Why would Buff as a production company choose this subject as its first issue? But it got the whole industry talking because around that time, Black Panther had come out and there was kind of all the issues about how dark the cast was, the predominant black, all black cast of Black Panther. And then you have Beyonce's father who had released his autobiography where he disclosed that when he was dating Beyonce's mother, he actually thought that she was white. <laughs> and that kind of guided how he dealt with his children in the industry in terms of shadism, which is what they yeah. call it in the United States. Shadism. And it's still prevalent today in terms of how um, these artists are marketed and, and how the audience consumes lighter skinned artists compared to darker skinned artists. Obviously the balance is redressed slightly, but it's still a conversation where there are a we're lot slow, of we're slowly going into an era where we're appreciating our skin more. Like this like black beauty is is is, is, is more prominent. And it's so wild, like how even the idea of like black beautiful and all that doesn't necessarily come from Africa, or that I mean we have it, we we are aware of it. A lot of us are like black proud and all that. But seeing it from America, for example, or here where they're so proudly black, it resonates louder because we're we're we're, we're consumers of of cultures outside of Africa. We like to consume. No. Yeah, I mean, colorism is, is a global issue. I mean, India, you've got the caste system. In the Caribbean, there are various islands that deal with this kind of shade as a issue. Um, I remember I was watching uh, cricket for a long time, and there was this commentator in the, in the Caribbean called Tony Cozier. And you just think, just hearing the commentary, you just immediately think, it must be a black person commentating. And then when I saw his face for the first time, he was white. It was like, oh, there's black Jamaicans. <laughs> I just assumed all Jamaicans are black. I've never met a white Jamaican, not seen them on screen. And I this know was of white yeah, I didn't actually know Ali G and kind of yeah. all of that kind of palaver with Ali G and kind of thought that he was kind of mocking black people, although the actor who played Ali G was white Jewish. So, you yeah. know, there's a lot of appropriation that kind of people don't kind of appreciate whether it's comedy or whether it kind of crosses the line in terms of why is black culture being seen this way or seen through the eyes of a white Jewish person. Like I said, I can't fight every battle, but this is what as black people, as black creatives, we were exposed to um, at the beginning of the 21st century. Okay. Um, so in terms of providing opportunities for creatives how because obviously you've had your experience of you know the industry and you know how tough it can be so how 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 are you making a, an impact in that sense of opportunities because a lot of the time you go to sets is is, is there's no black people on the set no cameraman light um makeup everyone is not black so mm -hmm. how what are you because you've got this, you've got this platform. So what, what exactly, what, how are you <laughs> providing an impact for the community in that sense? Well, like I said, the fact that the festival is there is kind of a testament and kind of a pathway for people to see that it is possible to showcase black work. Because there's a lot of people in this generation that weren't aware or are not aware of BFM, have never heard of Men in Shabazz. So any opportunity that I get to mention his name and the fact that Menlik was around in the 70s and 80s, because a lot of today's culture is about 
now and last year and five years ago. No one wants to think about what the world was like 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I'm all about the documentation because it's very important to know your past, to know where you're going. So, you know, I'm not here without Menelik Shabazz. And it's it's almost full circle now because Menelik uh, was from the Barbados originally. Um, and only a few weeks ago, um, I started a new post as artistic director of the Windrush Caribbean Film Festival. So all my kind of years of experience running buff and then starting at BFM with Menelik, who's of Caribbean descent. And here I am now, some 20 plus years later, working on the Caribbean Film Festival, even though Menelik has now passed away, it, that's pretty much full circle now. And he'll be smiling somewhere, thinking that his protege is now running a, um, a Caribbean Film Festival, kind of playing a huge part in making sure that everything that I developed with Buff and all the benefits that that has yielded and the conversations that it started. I can now impart that with uh, the team at Windrush led by another filmmaker, Francis Anne Solomon, who's of Trinidadian descent. And if you Google her, she's had a rich 30 plus year history in film and television, not just here in the UK, but also in the Caribbean and also in Canada where she's also the founder of the Caribbean Tales International Film Festival, which is working in partnership with the Toronto International Film Festival. So again, I'm all about championing the black culture wherever that is celebrated. And anything that I can do to champion that cause and to make sure that people are aware of it and are exposed to it and can take advantage of it, then I believe that is my calling. And until my number is called, by God, then that's what I will continue to do. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, with the move to this Caribbean festival, how are you, how are you still involved with Buff? Are you still like? There's, I know there's a shift that's happened with you and Buff. There is. So um, Buff is now run by my successor, Dustin Chinuri, who's also even Nigerian, and he's been running the festival for three years. So I've not been doing day-to-day -day buff for three years. Um, I've sat on the other juries at other film festivals. And obviously I've been producing as well, did no shade. Directed my own film last year, a documentary on a British Nigerian family, uh, Joe Joyce and his um, either British mum was blind. So that was premiered at buff last year. So I've, I've very much kept myself busy as a creative. So in terms of my new role at Windrush with the Caribbean Film Festival. Um, I've not been running Buff Day to Day for three years now. So my successor has been in place uh, since pretty much the pandemic. So he's another Ibra Nigerian uh, born in the UK, Justin Chinere. And he'd been running the festival for the last three years. Last year it was at Rich Mix. The year before that it was at Renaissance Studios in Brixton. And that's allowed me to kind of um, continue to be creative. So I produced and directed my first feature, which is a documentary on the heavyweight boxer Joe Joyce and his blind mother Marvel. They're a British Nigerian family who I've known personally for six years. And that film was shown at Buff last autumn. So that's what's been keeping me busy. I also sit on other juries of film festivals. So I sit on the Beeston Film Festival jury. I was part of um, the Northeast International Film Festival uh, very briefly. Um, and over the past few years, I've just kind of kept myself very busy. And I've been a father to two girls. So there's nice. been not that many days off for me. So in terms of working with um, your wife, Claire Anyama Sigwe, how is that um, dynamic like? Because obviously she was the director for No Shade. Yes. And yes, how was that? Well, in terms of the story, I, I didn't interfere too much, although she might disagree. But um, because that wasn't the original title. Um, the original title for the film was Dick and Diamonds. Okay. Um, which is kind of a euphemism in terms of how lighter girls and darker girls would kind of be favoured. So I think, let me get this right, the lighter girls 
liked the diamonds and the darker girls liked the dick. Well, I think it was the other way around. Like the what? The D-I-C... <laughs> yes, literally, yes. Literally? Yes. Oh, I thought, yeah, I thought I was hearing the wrong thing. <laughs> yes, so that's why, the, that's why the title was immediately changed. Um, oh my God, Mr. Like Manuel. <laughs> just to make it more palatable to audiences. Because already the issue of colorism was problematic, and then to have a title like that, but to be fair to Claire, that it speaks to kind of her life experience um, in terms of her upbringing and kind of what she's been exposed to. So, you know, she's very much no filter in terms of how she sees the world. And obviously, I guess the fact that we're together is kind of yin and yang. So I kind of make sure the best of her is put out there and the best of me is put out there. So that's how we work well together. So obviously... The title is always important in any kind of project because that sets the tone. And then, obviously, when we released the poster for the film, that kind of sent shockwaves because the poster was of our lead actress, who's now in a Netflix show, Queen and Zynga, um, Adesua Oni. So her first major project was No Shade five years ago. And in that poster, she was kind of... She had white cream on and she got very dark skin and she's looking at herself in the mirror with blonde hair on. And so that's what the industry saw as kind of the poster to the film thinking, what is going on here? And obviously when they go into more details about what the film's about and who's telling the story and it's buff, it got the whole industry talking. Claire did about 30 odd interviews across the BBC, Channel 5, World Service, um, Woman's Hour, Evening Standard. So everyone just wanted to know what this film was about. And we premiered the film um, at the Cannes Film Festival, and we were able to secure um, some closing finance for our marketing campaign later in the year, which allowed the film to be theatrically released around the UK, and it made Claire, to date, the sixth Black British female only in cinema history in the UK to release a film in the cinema. Um, although I'm sure that's going to change this year with Dion Edwards, um, who's just about to release Pretty Red Dress, um, starring Alexandra Burke from The oh, X Factor. Wow. Exactly, yeah. But there's only been seven in about 125 years. So wow. the fact that my wife Claire is one of them, the other six being Dion, as I've mentioned, Amor Asante. A lot of them are Nigerians, actually, although Amor was Ghanaian, you've got Ngozi Uwura, who was the first. Then you have Rongano and Yoni, who's uh, of um, Zambian Welsh descent. Um, you've got Destiny Egaraga, who's gone too far. And Debbie Tucker Green, the second coming. So, like I said, there's only been six, but there will be seven this year, which is always a good thing. And I'm all about black females getting their shine and their flowers. So, any opportunity I get to remind people that there's not that many doing what they're doing in film let alone TV, then that's something that people need to know because if it was easy, then everyone would be doing it. That's really important. That's really, really important. Um, just talk a bit about Nollywood. Like, there's definitely been a big growth in content in Nollywood and, you know, how it is created, the quality that is created in now and how it's even, it is even being consumed now. Like, is there any goal to sort of have any Nollywood feature for you? Nollywood is interesting right now because I've just returned with with Claire from the Berlin Film Festival, which also acts as a film market. So it was the European film market. So we just returned from there and through Bosch Studios, we were kind of there uh, trying to secure finance for some of the projects on our slate. So we've got a range of projects. We've got scripted, projects, we've got unscripted projects, romantic drama, music documentaries, crime dramas. So we've pretty much got a wide range of projects that we were taking to Berlin to complete finance on. Um, and then towards the end of the festival, we managed to catch a film. Um, and it was recommended to us when we attended a drinks party. And it was um, all of the colors between black and white, which has been all the rave at Berlin. It's a Nigerian film. Um, a couple of the producers are based here in the UK. And it was a film that was being talked about by CNN and by various other outlets and prior to the festival. 
And it's a film that deals with the LGBT community in Nigeria, which is something that has always been talked about, but not been portrayed on screen just because of the taboo of the LGBT experience, plus the fact that Nigeria is a very conservative country in terms of its values and its liberality, etc. So um, the fact that this film was part of Berlin, me and Claire saw it, it was a great film. But it came at a time where I was having conversations with other filmmakers and creatives about the industry of uh, Nollywood and what direction it was going because 12 months prior, um, I was in Nigeria as part of the BFI delegation. And it, I didn't realise at the time, but the UK and Nigeria do not have a co-production treaty. And I think the BFI, the British Film Institute, are trying to establish closer working ties with Nollywood. And then to think that there hasn't been closer working ties before then, but that's probably because Nollywood has always been seen as not waiting for anyone to kind of develop these films, these talents, producers, directors, writers. But now you've got the, the likes of Netflix now entering the Nollywood landscape. You've got Amazon Prime Video, Disney. Um, I'm sure Apple are going to enter that space. And whoever else, because Nigeria is obviously one of the largest black nations on earth. There's a population of 300 plus million, at least. Yeah. And if you can imagine those numbers, of course you're going to have all these companies trying to get a piece of the pie. The problem is we don't know how big that pie is or how big the potential is and um, whether Nigerian creators are going to be better off with this Western intervention or whether through this Western in intervention that Nollywood raises its game because obviously in terms of how creators are remunerated in Nollywood now, I don't think it's at the level or how uh, black creators are remunerated in the UK, the US, or other places. In Nigeria, I'm sure it's pretty low. Uh -huh. But for the productivity that Nigeria puts out week in, week out, I don't have the facts to hand, but the, the impression that I get from the conversations that I have is that there's a lot of filmmakers that are leaving Nigeria to kind of better their life as a yeah. creative elsewhere. Me. That's me right there. <laughs> <laughs> I literally had to leave. Tell me more, yeah, exactly. And even the stories, I couldn't tell. I remember when I wanted, like years ago, when I was pitching it to a couple of people and they're like, do you want to get killed? Because I was talking about LGBTQ, mental health, and, you know, mm -hmm. suicide, you know, and all that. And they're like, eh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely something that is, is real. Like, sometimes it's just so difficult to get your story told, uh, your, your creative expression expressed that you just have to go for greener pastures and then you go somewhere else like the uk for me for example and then you start dealing with racism and all the, all the stuff. i know I know. <laughs> I know but still you need to hold on to that story and that thing that makes you passionate about Definitely. why you need to Definitely. But the fact that the berlin film festival chose this nigerian film i think is going to be the wake-up call that nollywood needs because in that moment Nigeria has to face up, has to look at itself in the mirror. Because if this is what the wider world is embracing in terms of Nigerian cinema and all of the colours goes on to bigger acclaim, um, then obviously everyone's going to copy that and do the next, uh, the next big thing or imitate all of the colours. So there's going to be more LGBT content. And is Nigerian society ready for that? I doubt it somehow. No, I don't think so. so it would be like an underground hit, but it won't get mainstream because people won't proudly. But if it's, make, if it's making money, do you not think that that will then signal a sea change in terms of what types of stories? I don't think so because even the, the 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 MCU movie, what was the Eternals, where there was just one one emotional scene with a, a, a gay couple. Just right. one ten seconds and it was banned. <laughs> wow. So I don't know. I don't know about Nigeria yet. And it's so well that even the the LGBTQ sort of um, law was around twenty fifteen or, or something like that. So prior to that, it probably mm -hmm. you know it was so fine. And then at a certain point, a couple of years ago, it became against the law. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know. I'm not saying that that's the way uh, the industry should go, but it's certainly a wake-up call in terms of 
how the outside world is potentially seeing Nigerian cinema. I mean, I guess Black Panther changed the dial as well in terms of Afrofuturism and Wakanda and a lot of... Even Beyonce's Lion is King was a key. Exactly. Yeah, that one. Exactly. So there is hope in terms of other stories that haven't been told about African, Nigerian culture. You know, there's a lot of projects kind of dealing with the Ifa kind of tradition and kind of all the other kind of countless Nigerian traditions that have yet to be put to an audience. It is all that still to come. So Africa has got a rich well of stories that have yet to be exposed to. And then there's, you know, um, children, you know, children's television and children's content. I think that's a gap that needs to be filled. Huge. It's a massive business. You know, you've got Toko Melon, which the whole world was watching seemingly during the pandemic. Again, something I found out in Nigeria last year that it was the third most watched program on Netflix in Nigeria, Coco Melon. Wow. You know, where is Nigeria's equivalent? I, I think there's Omerberry, uh, which is doing quite well after two years. But, you know, I go back to obviously my kind of cousins creating Kumbe Fun Time in the 80s and 90s. There is scope for this, this huge potential you know, in children's programming which again is very important for the culture. It kind of goes back to what we're talking about now with the LGBT issues. What do we want our children to be exposed to? You know, do we want to be liberal? Do we want a certain way of life? These are all issues that I, as one person, cannot solve. I, I only want to you know, do what I believe to be the right thing through lived experiences and shared experiences in terms of the people that I spend the most time with, which is obviously my wife Claire and my children and all the people that have been part of my history with Buff and now with Windrush and obviously back in the day with BFM. Obviously, I also have to, I have to mention the fact that you have an MBE. Okay, so can you just quickly, or just roughly, um, tell us the experience of that, just being acknowledged, you know, for the contribution that you're that you're doing to the, to the general sure. public? Like, it must have been a, a quite a moment for you. Sure, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't do any of this for the MBE. I do it because I care about how our culture is represented. And at first, you don't know who, you don't know who has put you forward. So there's a nomination selection process. So from what I understand, two people who have previously been honoured have to put your name forward recommend to the monarch that this person should be honoured for their service. So I, I got a letter in the post in 2019. I think I've just come back from a trip to the Netherlands where we showed no shame, funnily enough. And um, the, letter, uh, the letter read that I've been nominated for an MBE for services to the ethnic film industry. Um, would I accept? And I said, yes, of course I would. Um, because that's the other thing with black people and the, the word empire you know I wasn't around when all of these atrocities by you know um, our colonial masters occurred so I was never going to be one of those people that would not accept the medal um, so I had no hesitation in going to Buckingham Palace um, and receiving the medal from Prince Charles um, he then spent five minutes with me but it's not one of those normal kind of conversations. The whole event is not normal anyway because there's so much protocol that you have to follow, such as you need to bow your head before you wait to speak to Prince Charles, all of that. They, fortunately, they got my surname right. So what happened was, it's a very funny story. So they had an Indian uh, kind of guy um, kind of meet me at the entrance. And he asked for my name, and I said my name, Chukwemeka Emmanuel Aninusigwe. And the next time I saw him was an hour later when the ceremony actually took place. So there were a hundred of us that were kind of getting our medals. So Ainsley Harriet, the chef, he was honoured on the same day that I was. And obviously, if you know Ainsley Harriet, he's got a very loud laugh. Uh -huh. Obviously, when he laughed, the whole room just kind of like started laughing. It's almost like someone sneezing and everyone sneezes. It's so infectious. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was very surreal just being in the same room as Ainsley Harriet. 
and also getting your medal alongside him. So we were all in the queue waiting for our name to be called and then you go up um, and then there's a guard standing there saying, make sure you bow your head because if you don't, you give me the look, make sure everything falls in line. And then you walk and see Prince Charles in front of you. And then I heard my name and I saw the Indian boy standing next to the announcer. So in that moment, I then realized the reason why he asked for my name at the entrance was to make sure that he didn't get my name wrong. And then one of the cool tears afterwards said to me that they had a bet, um, make sure that whoever got my name wrong would probably get a punishment or something. Uh. So it was very important to them that they got my name right. So I just kind of respected that because a lot of people get my name wrong, uh. including Nigerian. But anyway, <laughs> um, so Pitchell spoke to me for five minutes and kind of said, because of the Prince's trust, the work that I was doing with Bath were very similarities. And the Prince's Trust had supported people like Idris Elba and David Yellow when they were starting out. So the fact that I was doing something similar was... And it's self-funded too. Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Emmanuel. This has been a very informative, educational, inspiring conversation with you. And I hope, you know, one of my goals is to at least be able to submit one short film to the buff and hopefully get that into like you know other festivals and everything like that so it's very very um inspiring like i said earlier you're a black man in the game you're doing it you're killing it very proud of you and you know just keep pushing we're watching you you're inspiring us and thank you everyone for listening or watching this is the real happy hour podcast see you guys soon thanks for having me